So many of you won't have read much about Jan and won't have seen him much in public because he's been leading quite a stealthy operation. In fact, I went there last month to write a story for Wired. It's an unmarked office. Nobody in the valley seems to know where WhatsApp is. But you're having a massive impact. When I went there last month, I think the numbers of active users, not just registered users, but active monthly users, had just gone up from 350 million to about 400 million. And on the day I visited, 16 billion messages had gone through the system. How have things changed since the last month, Jan? How many active users do you have today? Um, well, for, first of all, thanks for having us here at DLD. We, we always talk about active users because it's more important than registered users. Um, we now have, I believe, 430 million, something like that. So another 30 million just in a couple of weeks. Uh, since, I think, two months since you visited. Uh, but I think what's more interesting is that in Germany alone, we have over 30 million active users, not just registered, but people who actually use our application at least once a month. And uh, we're so overwhelmed by our growth, it's kind of mind-boggling to think that we have over 400, people, 400 million people use our product uh, regularly. It's just, it's just mind-boggling to us. And we're so humbled by our growth and by our success. And when I went there, I think there were only about 50 people working at WhatsApp's office. Yeah, we're extremely small. We, we actually have probably one of the highest ratio of engineers to millions of users. We have, I think, 25 engineers in the company overall and about 20 people doing customer support in all the different languages. So that when our users from uh, Brazil write in Portugal or from Germany write in German, we actually reply in the language that they write in. And uh, we, we're an extremely small company, and we're, we're lucky to work with so many smart I'm lucky to work with so many smart people that are able to make such an impact with such a small team. Your business model is pretty atypical for a messaging app. It's not necessarily free. You're charging for a download. You're charging annual subscription fees. Explain how you're thinking. We don't charge for downloads. The download is actually uh, free. The software itself is free. We charge for the service. It, it's a very similar model that you've had for a long time with a telephone company or your water company or your gas company. Because we think of our product as a very basic utility. And from the day we started the company, we always felt that doing advertising in our product would be a very wrong thing to do. Uh, there are companies that are built around advertising. There are great technology companies in Silicon Valley that monetize by advertising to their users. We just felt that we wanted to take a different route. For us, um, putting advertising on something so personal that is your phone and putting advertising in a way of people trying to communicate and wanting to stay in touch and messaging each other would be just so, uh, in our mind, wrong. And so we decided to build a product that is built around people actually giving us money. And this way, we can have a direct relationship with our customers. Uh, we didn't want to have a third party, an advertiser in a way. We wanted to make sure that when people pay us for the product, they actually pay us for the product and we deliver our product to them that they enjoy to use. On your desk is a post-it note written by your co-founder, Brian, which I think says, you know, no ads, no, no it games. it says no games, no, no ads, no gimmicks. No gimmicks. Yeah. You really don't like advertising. And, and I got him to sign it. <laughs> um, yeah, we feel that uh, we just want to focus on messaging. To us, there is, there is a lot of coolness in having a pure, simple uh, messaging. And if people want to play games, there are plenty of other uh, sites and applications they can go to and, and play games. And uh, there are also a lot of other great companies that are built around advertising. To us, it's just the simplicity of the product and the utility of our product is really what drives us. We really want to have that simple, pure messaging experience. So you're a profitable business. 
we make money, but the important thing for us today is not monetization. We're not focused on monetization today because we're still growing. We're still in the growth phase of the company. And someday in the future, we will focus on monetization. But today, we're more interested in making sure that those people who sign up have a great user experience. They have service that always works. They have applications that is fast, that it doesn't crash, that it's reliable. Because every single message counts, right? And we handle eight, 18 billion messages a day these days, uh, inbound, and then I think like 36 billion outbound. I think every day we process 50 billion messages in total, billion. And so to us, it's very important to have a service and a system that is reliable and always, always works. And that's what we focus on today. Monetization is something that we'll look at in 2016 or 2018 or 2020, it's, it's far, far down the road. And that's almost as many messages as going through SMS. I, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> so there's other messaging companies that maybe aren't making as much money as WhatsApp that are getting offers for three billion, four billion dollars, it's reported, Snapchat being one example. Um, how much pressure are you coming on to sell to one of these companies that wants to get on the back of the fast growth you're experiencing? Well, I think for us, uh, when we started the company, for me and Brian personally, we wanted to build something that is here for long term. We wanted to build something sustainable. It's, it's not that hard to sell a company. But if you look at the great companies that we have today, Facebook and Google and Yahoo and Twitter, the companies that have been around for a long time, they didn't sell, they actually stuck around and stayed independent and built a great offering to their users. And sure, we might be different in our philosophies where they are doing a lot of advertisement-driven business and we're doing a lot of consumer direct uh, business. But uh, I think for us, it's always been about building a company that is here to stay, that is here for the next, 100, uh, for the next 10, 20, 50 years. So what I found remarkable going to see Jan is a couple of blocks down the road in Mountain View is the building where you, when your family was on welfare, were picking up food stamps. This has been a pretty remarkable journey. So you came as an immigrant from Ukraine when it was communist under the Soviet Union. What was it like arriving in California, age 16, uh, well, there was no technology that we have today, and I actually remember uh, trying to keep in touch with my friends and family. It was not that easy. You had all these like long-distance telephone companies and MCI and at and and you had to sign up for a plan, and, and just communicating and staying in touch in 1992 was so difficult and so painful, and, and when you're an immigrant and you don't really have a lot of financial resources to do it, it gets even more challenging. I think part of why we want, we're so passionate about communication is we, we hear stories of people who are able to stay in touch with their families across the world now because of WhatsApp and uh, don't have to pay exuberant fees for SMS messages or anything like that. And so uh, part of what shaped us uh, during our upbringing is what is driving us today to offer this technology to make sure that people, no matter where they are geographically, can stay connected and they can do it without having to pay a lot of money. I often find that the real breakthrough entrepreneurs are those who are outsiders in some way. And you coming from the former USSR, not speaking the language when you got there. I mean, you were an outsider. How much of the WhatsApp experience do you think is connected with your own background? I mean. You didn't grow up with advertising, for instance. Do you right. think that helped shape your approach to advertising? Yeah, I, I actually grew up in a country where advertising didn't exist, and, and I had a pretty remarkable childhood. One, one person doesn't like advertising. Um, so uh, you're right, it definitely does shape uh, what you do in life later. And uh, to me, looking back at my childhood, it was just this kind of idealistic environment where uh, even though we didn't really have that great of a political system and there were like thousands of other problems with the country, the joy of kind of growing up in a very uncluttered lifestyle uh, 
was, was really good because you could focus on things like education, which was really valuable in, in USSR. Um, and moving to, to a different country, you could see the difference where uh, there was not, uh, there was a lot of clutter. You, you see that clutter coming in through the advertisement noise, and we just wanted to make sure that our product was an exception to that. Another aspect of growing up in the Soviet Union was the state was monitoring quite a lot of what the citizens were doing. There's been a lot of concern lately about messaging companies, among others, being targeted by the US National Security Agency. How much are you concerned about being a target for those seeking to breach the privacy of the users, and how are you protecting the users? So, actually, on a plane over here, when I was flying to Germany, I watched a movie called The Life of Others. Uh, I think it's Das Leben der Anderen in German. And the movie actually touched on a very personal note to me. Uh, I, I grew up in a country where I remember my parents not being able to have a conversation on the phone. My mom would often say, this is not a phone conversation. I'll, I'll tell you in person. The, the walls had ears, and you couldn't speak freely, freely when I was growing up in a country. And so, to me, being shaped by those experiences, it's, it's extremely important to make sure that we provide the level of privacy and security that um, people would be able to use our product freely and not being afraid. Part of that is our philosophy that stems with no advertising, is that we don't collect people's personal information. Unlike a lot of companies that are built around advertising, we don't know your gender, we don't know your name, we don't know where you live, we don't know your address. You just know the phone number. Just the phone number and people you message with and people you want to message. And, and I think uh, even messages themselves are not really stored on our servers the moment they're delivered to your phone. So how do I know when I'm sending a WhatsApp message to somebody else that it can't be intercepted? You don't store it on the server, but what right. happens between my phone and the server? Well, so we have encryption in place between the phone and the server to make sure that it is protected from basic kind of snooping and eavesdropping. Uh, and I think the important thing to keep in mind is that for us, the product and the user experience and, and everything is built around this kind of us knowing as little as possible about the user and what they do on our network. So you're on all sorts of platforms. Um, you've had a bit of trouble sometimes on the Apple platform. There's been you know, problems with approval of the app. What can you say about your experiences? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that there have been problems. I think the, the difference in Apple and Android ecosystems are that Android is more open, and we actually enjoy working a lot with Android. We were able to build new features and prototype on Android a lot faster and a lot easier. And not to mention the fact that we have a lot more users, obviously, on Android and more users signing up every day. I think. As a developer, as an engineer, we enjoy working with Android more. It's, it's open, it's open source, and we're able to prototype, our engineers are able to prototype a feature, push it out to hundreds of millions of users overnight, and if we find an issue, a mistake, or a bug, we can fix it right away. And this kind of quick fix, quick iteration is extremely important to anybody who is building a product that is affecting lives of so many people. So you're now pretty much the incumbent in the messaging space, getting on for half a billion active users. Does that not make you vulnerable to nimble startups that come along with new approaches to messaging? You know, we've got Snapchat, we've got Line, we've got Kakao. How can you be sure that WhatsApp will continue to grow when there are innovations happening that are changing behavior more quickly than you can respond to? Oh, we still think of ourselves as a startup. You've been to our office. We're, we're 50 people. We're 25 engineers. It doesn't get any more startups than that, right? Um, I think for us, uh, the important thing is focus. We focus on messaging. We're not focused on being an advertising network or a gaming network or a disappearing photos network. In fact, uh, my co-founder, who recently had a baby, has a group chat where his uh, nanny and, and his mom, they share videos of his baby. And for him, those videos are so important. And the pictures of the baby are so important that to have them go missing and disappear would actually be counterintuitive to what we want to build. Uh, I think for us, the basic idea will continue to be 
a simple messaging app where we get out of the way and we just want to let people communicate and stay in touch. And I think if we continue to stay focused on that, we will be able to uh, make sure that people continue to use our product. But if I want to send somebody a photo that disappears a few seconds later, I can't use WhatsApp. But that's the beauty of an open and free market system is that you can go download another application that lets you do that. You've made a journey, huh? How big can you see WhatsApp getting? How many users do you think is feasible? Our goal when we started was to be on every single smartphone in the world. I think today there's probably a billion and a half, two billion smartphones. So clearly we're not doing that good a job. Um, <laughs> in the next couple of years, uh, I think people are predicting five billion smartphones total. Our goal continues to be on every single one of those phones. We want WhatsApp to be a communication platform that is on every single smartphone that people use to stay in touch, to communicate, to share their thoughts and passions and wishing each other good night and good mornings. And you promise us that you're going to go for the big one and not sell out in the meantime? That's our goal. We're, we're trying to build a company that we can be proud of and not something that is built just to quickly pump and dump. Please can we thank the man with thank the vision, you. Jan Kuhn.